Hi, this is Marty Otanias. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology, a story-based approach to cannabis research, education, and funding. Uh, this is episode 24, and the focus is on green lung. We have a guest today named Scott Burtis. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you. So um, you've been really generous with your time. We mm -hmm. spoke in um, October or September of fall 2016, mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to have you on the show to update people on some of the work you're doing. Sure, awesome. So why don't you tell us about one of the recent things that you're doing related to cannabis? Okay, uh, one of the releasing things I've been doing to cannabis has been uh, starting a YouTube channel, number one, uh, where I can focus on the medical benefits of cannabis, say for an example with depression, autism, uh, you know, the things that function in the brain, uh, mental disorders, you know, anything where cerebral palsy, anything like that where the brain's constantly firing off. Uh, to see if cannabis can, you know, relax that the mind enough to where people that deal with, you know, constant seizures all the time, they're constantly tensing up all the time, is able to relax that mindset. So we talk about the different videos and uh, in the videos we talk about the different strains and which ones are, are more, you know, into the, uh, which ones more will better affect a person than just say numbers that get high. Uh, we're taking, I want to take it a different level. And the other thing that I'm working on is an actual farm, a uh, research farm, where people can, will be growing cannabis and at the same time have a research facility to where if patients want to volunteer to come in, they can do so. You know, you can come in there and you can actually talk to a professional, talk to somebody who knows what they're doing, uh, whether it's a licensed psychologist, psychiatrist, some kind of person in the medical field, Somebody's gonna know because one of the main things in the, from medical cannabis is you never know if the, if the same, like if you get, say for an example, a blue strain, blue dream strain this week, it might be 25% THC, but the next week it might only be 17. So the THC consistencies have to be the same. See, and that's where a lot of people, a lot of people will say, well, I use blue dream to treat depression, for an example. Uh, if the THC percentages are not consistent, then you're not effectively treating it just by smoking cannabis. You see what I'm saying? You know, what was the moment where you decided, oh, I want to get some videos on YouTube, and then what would people see when they go visit your channel? What happened to me was I was not finding the information that I was looking for. I was looking to treat my own depression with cannabis, and I wasn't finding the information. They would have, you know, long-winded studies on how to, you know, treat cannabis, you know, use cannabis for depression, but they weren't very definitive on you know, does it work or not? And I wanted to have, you know, a discussion-based YouTube channel to where people can have question and answer dialogue. And, you know, if somebody knows more than the other person, then they can, uh, you know, add it in. So I created these videos with that intent. It was with the intent of, you know, making sure that, you know, people had the knowledge to be able to see what they wanted it and how to use it effectively. Uh, you know, it takes more than just cannabis to treat a depression. You know, if you're just using cannabis, you're a fool. You know, you have to add more actual natural supplements to that, exercise, water, diet, all those things. And we talk about those things in the video. So when they go through there, they're gonna see, right now I have probably two or three videos up there. Uh, one on autism and, you know, and one on depression. The one on depression is very introductory. Uh, a few minutes will be, you know, they're not really in detail yet. Uh, the next one coming up will be more in detail, probably a good 30 minute video of all of the expansions of how THC, THCA, and all these different variants affect the mind and how that is going to overall extend the cannabis, I mean, extend to your depression or whatever you're, you're battling. There's no doubt in our society, um, anxiety, depression is stigmatized in so many ways. Yes. So what was the point in your life where you realized um, if you were taking chemical synthetic drugs, mm -hmm. that, that cannabis was helpful for you? Like take us to one moment where you realized that this was um, something that was a remedy for, for your condition. I was going through a very uh, bad uh, depression. I suffer from bipolar, so it's a little bit deeper than a, I guess a depression state. Uh, manic depressants, what it was once called, and you know, I was taking the prescriptions that they were giving me, and it just didn't seem to make me feel normal. Uh, so one day, I decided to try a combination of different strains together, 
to see. I wanted to try uh, you know, some recommendations from friends. And by doing so, it made me feel normal again, to an extent. Uh, now, cannabis, like I said, cannabis by itself wasn't enough. But it did make me, it took me out of the depressed state and put me in a playing field. Now, obviously, you can't be high all day. Uh, that would not be effective. So CBD oils and the tinctures and stuff like that, uh, I found to be very effective for me. And then when I started to notice it was effective for me, I wanted to find out does this affect it for other people that battle depression? Do they, you know, anxiety or PTSD, are they finding that cannabis is effective for them? Uh, so that was when I started to want to start putting, getting more information out, you know, let's see what's really out there, you know, and let's find out the truth, you know, because there's a lot of fluff from both sides of the spectrum. You have people that hate cannabis and they're going to find, oh, I see it's all these things are wrong. And then you have the people that are, huge 420 green people and they got, you know, well, we can do all, you know, they, they point, they all have their statistics, but what is the facts? You know, it's like there's two sides to every story and somewhere in the, the middle there's the truth. And that's what I'm looking to get to is that truth point, you know, so that people can have, you know, the ability to, you know, effectively medicate themselves the proper and the right way. Talk to me as if I'm a young person, 21 and, and over, and I'm curious about dealing with my um, depression using um, cannabis. What would you recommend to me if I'm a little hesitant and waffling, like I'm taking my drugs regularly without cannabis? So what mm -hmm. would be a few things to consider as you get into this as a remedy? Go to their, whoever they're, they're treating with, you know, whoever they're, they're a psychiatrist, is, psychologist, however they're getting their, whoever they're getting their medication from. And, you know, have some blood work, get some levels done, and see where they are. And then, you know, start off small, you know, maybe 10 milligrams a day. If you're not, if you never smoked cannabis before, you want to start off at a small pace and then gradually build yourself, you know, to your tolerance level. Um, I would recommend people starting off with maybe edibles first. Uh, you know, that way you don't have the, the smell, the smoke and all that. It's a little bit more uh, conservative that way or the tinctures. Uh, those ways are a little bit more effective. Uh, now, if, you, if you're able to, consume the smoke, then I would suggest concentrates and flour, you know, it's a good way to mix it. Uh, but that's how I usually would start off with people. You know, go talk to your psychiatrist first and get a baseline so that you know if it's effectively positively changing you or if it's negatively affecting you. Uh, because it could have a negative reaction to some people. It could cause you to go into a deeper depression. So you can't just say that cannabis is going to cure everything you have to find, you know, what's the real truth. And the truth is, is that every individual is going to be different. So what about for you? What's the ideal um, mixture that helps you be normal? Like, is there a particular strain and how do you like to consume? So I use Jack Herrera, uh, Bruce Banner number three, and Gorilla Glue number four. And then occasionally I use Purple Kush. Uh, I find Purple Kush to be very, very effective for depression. Uh, it is by itself it's just very difficult to find a decent strain of it. Uh, there's not too many growers around here that, that I, I mean, I'm sure that not that I see this video, I'll get some, sh some emails of it, but it's mostly Purple Kush. Um, you can, that by itself, and then if not, I mix the other three equally. Uh, but like I said, you wanna make sure your THC consistency is the same. So if you're smoking something that's 25%, you wanna make sure that you find something else that's 25% as well. It's not necessarily the flavor of the strain that you're looking for. I mean, the terpamines do have a mild ability, but it's the THC that you're looking for that kind of balances it out. Uh, the terpamines do have some effect, but very, very little, that I would say. You know, that's just, you know, from my, my own opinion. I'm not a scientist or a doctor or anything like that, so, you know, regular guy. Uh, what would be, for you, the ideal way to consume? You know, I enjoy the, the smoke flavor of it. Now, you know, I smoke out of a blunt, which is like a cigar wrap. Uh, that's, you know, of course you're smoking tobacco, so you're gonna take the chance of, you know, risking that. Now, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've tried everything. I don't prefer the vape, uh, simply because I think you're risking bronchi bronchitis type infections uh, with moisture going in your lungs all the time. Uh, so I don't prefer the vape method. You know, to me, smoking, old fashioned way, uh, I've done it all my life since I was, you know, nine years old that way and it's not going to change. Okay. Know? And then yes. what about today? How are you feeling? How's your, your, your condition? It's, it's good. And as long as you keep, like I said, as long as I consistently 
it's a maintaining, it's a maintenance thing. You know, as you're, if you're taking your meds like you're supposed to, doing all the things that you're supposed to do, exercising, drinking water, and you know, properly eating the right things, you knowing what to avoid, then it's fine for me every day. Every day, you know, is a normal day. In your own family or among your friends, mm -hmm. has there been anyone that like stigmatized you or said something funny because you use cannabis as a way to just maintain your, your balance? I get the uh, older generation of my family, oh, it's an allegiance, you know, you're gonna turn into uh, someone that smokes crack or you're gonna lead you to some other, other drug or, you know, and it's, you know, all these stigmatas that have been placed since the 30s when Reefer Madness first came out, you know, it's like they've never lost that that cheats and chong mentality. It's like that stigmata still still sticks. And even though, you know, we have the research ability now, you know, with all the cannabis, Rec's been out now for four years now. And we can clearly see that people are not walking around smoking crack. They didn't lead them to other drugs. You know, so these kind of stigmatas, I would hope with years to come, that that's, you know, eventually gonna go away. But yeah, I do get a lot of, a lot of grief. Uh, even from the medical profession, they, they've I've been told that cannabis is worse than tobacco. What sure. would you give um, in terms of advice to me mm -hmm. if I want to talk to my physician and introduce the idea of cannabis as a potential uh, medicine that I can take? How would, you, how would that conversation go or what should I think about as I get into that um, uh, conversation with my physician? And, uh, when I went to my doctor, um, I explained to him right up front that I treat myself with cannabis medication. I do not take uh, pharmaceutical painkillers, uh, antibiotics I will take, you know, but anything that would alter your mind, uh, like Percocets or anything like that, no. Uh, so they will, you know, of course, you know, they kind of dumb it down as they'll try to, uh, they'll try to make you feel like you're less intelligent right away because they automatically put pot people in a certain category. So what I do is I, I say, let's put the results you know, to the test, you know, let's get the blood work drawn and let's see if, you know, this is where the illness is today. Let's come back in a week, let's take some more blood work and let's see if the cannabis is actually affected it or not. And then if it's not, then we can try their method and see if, you know, they have that, that way of doing it, you know, but that's pretty much how I approach it. They will give you some grief for it. Uh, you have to be careful, especially if you have kids um, I would highly not mention that to your physician. You're risking CPS problems. Uh, even in Colorado where it's legal, you know, if you're a parent and you're, even if your kids have seizures, even though they know that CBD oil is non-psychoactive, if they catch you, you're in big trouble. So uh, approach that with caution. My mom is a strong-willed woman in her early 60s. Open a dictionary and turn to the word glue. You'll see a picture of my mom. She keeps our family together. My mom has an open door policy. I can drop by for any reason just to have some tea or eat lunch. Holidays are the best days in mom's kitchen. The aromas of Zeresh Polo and Adas Polo make me want to eat everything the minute I step inside. In winter 2015, my mom was involved in a car accident in Denver. Daily, she struggles with chronic pain due to her injuries. The cortisone injected by doctors worked for a little while. Surgery is a last resort option. It breaks my heart to see her deal with extreme pain in her back and neck. Her day begins by waking up with pain and staying in bed trying to find comfort until late afternoon. Heating pads are pressed against her body with little or no effect. Ibuprofen barely helps and gives her stomach aches. As I rearrange her pillow, she tells me that she can't lift her arms over her head. The pain in her upper body is simply too much. My mom used to take English and psychology classes at Community College of Denver, but she stopped so she can focus on trying to manage her pain. In May 2016, I'm taking a course called Cannabis Culture at CU Denver. The other day, students and I went on a field trip to a grow house in Boulder. After the field trip, I visited the adjacent dispensary and purchased a cannabis salve. 
Cannabis salve is a topical ointment used for deep muscle relief. It is a hybrid and contains 14.2 mg of THC, 8.6 mg of THCA, and 7.5 mg of CBD. Brooke, the grower and owner of the facility, mentioned that she started this grow house just because of the salve. She was talking about how great of a product it was and how she made it for her father-in-law. Brooke was in the process of making it and it healed her psoriasis. Seeing it was such a miracle drug for her, I figured I would buy it for my mom. It was an impulse purchase and I didn't think that the salve would reduce my mom's pain. When I returned home, I told her about the cannabis-infused salve. She has always been anti-drugs and it didn't surprise me that she was uninterested to use the cannabis on her body. Several hours later, my mom was experiencing pain in bed. She said, I replied, Without talking, she pointed to the area on her back where she felt pain. I applied it. Within minutes, she got out of the bed and said, Standing upright, she lifted up her arms. I couldn't help but smile. A few minutes later, my mom and I are drinking cardamom and saffron black tea in the kitchen downstairs. She tells me, هیچ وقت فراموش نمی کنم خوبیاتو. Hi, welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. I'm with Scott Burtis. He's a contract worker in Colorado's cannabis industry. Uh, Scott, why don't you tell me about the farm you mentioned earlier in, in the show? What's the farm that you're working on and what, um, why is it important to you? The purpose of the farm was to create a research facility where we have a lab in-house so that we can you know, dissect cannabis to find out what works, what doesn't. People can come in with, with real medical conditions, say for an example, you know, they have cancer or some type of you know, inflammation. The things that cannabis is known to cure. Now, you know, when people just come in for everyday colds and stuff like that, probably not so much those type of illnesses, more so much on the mental side we're trying to really hone in on is the depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Those are the things, uh, cerebral palsy, anything that's you know, brain-related functions, we're trying to you know, have a facility where we're growing the cannabis ourselves so we control it. And then we can actually have you know, a base, you know, test subjects that come in you know, that's a baseline so we can see what's, what's real. Because right now, like if you look on your cannabis THC bottle, it says 25%. There's a 15% negative or positive margin of error in that. Very so that's a huge, huge difference. So if you're at 25%, you could really only be smoking 10%, you know, THC, but they're selling it to you at 25%. So we want to, you know, take those things and put some real numbers. Let's put some real black and white to these, to these things. And, you know, w if we can, the more funding we get, is, is, that's the key. That is the key. Because right now, you know, we're at a million dollars. And as you know, in this cannabis industry, it is, difficult for anything with a million dollars you're not getting far so we're trying to raise as much money as possible to get the help that people really need so that when people say the cannabis is a medical thing and the doctor says prove it now you'll have black and white proof hey this research facility with credible people phd people are backing this up real science behind it and this is the facts so that we can eventually, somebody other than myself, will be able to go to DC or somewhere like that and be able to say, hey, you guys can legalize cannabis. That's why you've been holding a patent on it for so long. Now we have the proof, here it is. So far, what has been one of the lessons learned or an obstacle you faced and how have you overcome it? Um, the obstacles uh, that we face is, you know, what makes you an expert? Um, that's the biggest thing. Your credibility is the biggest thing. And the team that we're hiring on is going to be people that are educated, credible people, people that are with science degrees, people that are, you know, passionate about cannabis. But we also want to have people that are skeptical of cannabis with us too because they're going to be the opposition. They're going to be the people that are always questioning and helping us to counterbalance it. So we won't just want, we want to have a, a mixture of both. 
So we want the skeptics working in this lab, but we also want the people that are passionate about cannabis too, because they're going to be questioning each other and constantly putting the challenges up. You know, so we want to see, you know, like I said, what's and that's been the biggest obstacle. You know, what is your credibility? Where did you come from? You know, why, because you smoke weed, does that make you an expert all of a sudden in medical cannabis? Uh, location, we're looking in Northern Colorado, uh, simply because there's a lot more uh, land out there. We want to get away from the city. Uh, it gives people a chance to, you know, just forget their work life for a little while and just, you know, it's in the farm country. So it's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, for people, I, I do believe. Uh, right now, we're in the process of acquiring the land. That's going to be the getting through all the county and all their uh, hurdles. Like I said, that's that's the biggest part of it. You know, is get if, if we had to go through all the red tape or the legal headache, and we could just actually get to the part of this building and start to, you know, let the science part of it get to do its work, we would be already there, uh, making progress. But because you have to go through so many regulations and you know med and the state and then the county and then you know it's like it's just one hurdle after another so we're looking at a, you know probably another two or three years before we even get you know off the ground you know and you know unless we get some some major corporate sponsors uh right now we're dealing with venture capitalists and that's in itself uh fun so you know it's all all learning experience now when i first met you again in fall mm. of 2016 you discussed with me some of your work actually trimming and yes. other kinds of activities in mm. the um, cannabis sector here in colorado sure so why don't you tell uh, viewers a little bit more what is your experience either trimming or working okay. in cultivation facilities and are you still doing it today okay i um i worked in the cannabis industry when when rec first came out uh i started out uh, doing my own contracts, uh, kind of working for myself, uh, contracting out to local grows, and then hiring on other trimmers, and then I actually worked for a few uh, companies in the process as well. Uh, I've done trimming, growing, and I've worked in the bud tending side uh, just to kind of get a view. I wanted to see how the product came in the door and how I pushed out the door. So I wanted to learn, you know, from the front end to the back. Uh, I currently am not in the cannabis industry uh, right now as far as working as a trimmer butt tender uh, because I live in northern Colorado you're limited on those type of jobs most of those jobs are going to be here in the Denver area now um, in terms of your experiences as a trimmer mm -hmm. um, did you ever find there was one or two health or safety concerns and if so what was one of those concerns the biggest concern uh, for people in the trimming industry is you have the powdery mildew issue and then you're constantly bringing in, breathing in keef and things like this. Uh, these things have been known to cause respiratory problems, uh, definitely like bronchitis, you'll, you'll have, and almost, it'll stay with you. Uh, you'll see people break out of rashes on their arms and stuff like that when a keef uh, begins to get on you. I mean, you're dealing with raw plant material all day long and you have no respiration no type of protection. Uh, most of those grows are very hot, so you can't wear your Tyvek suit. You'll see, usually you'll have like two of them hanging up uh, in the hallway for the, you know, to keep the OSHA guidelines, I would imagine, off of them. But there's no type of, there's not a proper ventilation in these grow houses. And that's a very serious problem because when you have those mold spores constantly, you're breathing this in every day, every day, and that's bad. Can you tell us about one incident where maybe you were working as a trimmer mm -hmm. and then uh, you may have had some kind of reaction because of mold or powder mm -hmm. and mildew? Like what happened and, and what um, did you do? Could you in, um, tell the employer? Could you tell the boss? And just kind of guide us through that story. Um, I was working for a larger grow and the, the way they had their trim table set up was four people stand on either side of this just stand up rack and in the middle they had like a tarp that would catch all the all the bud and the problem with that is it would catch all the keef too. So every time you would you would trim and a bud would fall down into the trough, the keef would wharf up until you you start breathing this in. Same thing with the mold spores and the powdery mildew. So for me, I started noticing that my breathing was becoming worse and worse. I started having uh, a lot of mucus problems, you know, there's always congestion and, you know, I was constantly coughing all the time, even when I wasn't, and I'm not, I'm not a, I don't smoke cigarettes. So it was not much of a uh, hard to, to figure out where it was coming from. And then when I started noticing it in other people, 
uh, that's when I had to, I did, you know, take an approach to try to talk to some of the people. Now, when you talk to the dispensary owners, they'll say that there's nothing they can do about it. You know, these warehouses in Denver are old, and some of them are just, you know, leak water and, you know, whatever the case may be. But, you know, proper airflow uh, would help that. Uh, some ultraviolet technology, you can put the ultraviolet systems in the air conditioned systems themselves to you know, help prevent a lot of that. Uh, so let me ask you this. Do you think this is a problem isolated to you because you're a little sensitive, or do you think this is um, a larger problem within the cannabis sector in Colorado? I think it's a larger problem, and I think it goes unnoticed a lot, uh, very much so. I think the workers, they don't like to say too much because they don't want to lose their job. They like the job that they do. They like the job, the fact that they're able to you know, grow their, work in a grow, and if you say something, then you may be fired, you may be labeled uh, a problem employee, uh, things like that. You know, I mean, there's definitely steps that uh, the workers can take. You can contact MED, the Medical uh, Enforcement Division, Marijuana Enforcement Division, and they can, uh, you know, they can come and check the grow to make sure that uh, there's no type of health risk to the to the employee. But you're dealing with big money here, and that's the problem. Uh, you know, if we if the, if the workers had a union or some type of you know fighting chance, something to back up against, then a lot of this would be corrected. Yeah. Uh, but because they don't, they don't have any leg to stand on, and they know that the owners know that there's like 1,500 applications a week where people just want to come and work with with weed, so they can just fire you and hire somebody else right away. And it's unfair to the worker. You know, you have to pay for your badge number one just to even get the job. You know, you have to come out of pocket to mm -hmm. get the low paying job. They're only going to pay you maybe $12 an hour at most. And you're not even going to be able to live off of that. And then on the same time, you're breathing in all these harshness. And if you try to say something, well, right away, they're going to, you know, quiet you up. There's not really much you can do. It's either find another industry to work in until they change it. Uh, you know, because the larger the grow, sometimes the worse that condition can be. So sometimes I think people get under the assumption that these big companies are safe, and it's not necessarily the case. And it's just a matter of you know checking yourself to know. Uh, I know there's ways to cleanse out your lungs and things like that through uh, lemon juice and things like that. There's things you can look up online to help. But as far as what I did, nothing. There was nothing you could do. So what about this idea that I've heard someone mention in the past that this is um, in Colorado? because of our industrial production uh, mm -hmm. approach, mm -hmm. it's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that the problem of powdery mildew and mold is an epidemic in Colorado? I think so. I think the, the, the main thing is, is that they're, they're hurrying up to cure the weed. They only have a two-day drying time, which, and if you say that, if you talk to the owners, they're gonna say, well, the supply and demand is so great, and that's why. Well, the supply and demand can wait, because put a 30-day cure on your cannabis, and drying defectively the right way would, would make a better product and overall you could increase that production and have enough stored up to where it would eventually catch up to their current flow that is now. Now you have, they cut a plant down, they don't even let it go through the complete flowering time. Uh, in Colorado typically 56 day flowering time is, is it. So if your plant is say for an example like a sour diesel that may require 70 you know, days of flowering time, well, you just chop that to 56. And then they hurry up and they rush to dry it in a couple of days with these dehumidifiers and all these things. So all the water rushes to the front of the plant and it has nowhere to go. And that's the problem that they keep running into. And they'll say that supply and demand, that's why, that's why, that's why, you know, we, it's all about the money for them. They're not concerned about the health of the workers or the consumer. You know, you're dealing with it from both aspects. You're dealing with it from the worker side. The worker deals with the raw product, but the consumer is dealing with the, with the end product, and the end product still has mold on it, and they don't know. Uh, when we did talk earlier, you work with me about um, explaining this idea of the problem of exposure to powdery mildew and mold as something called um, green lung. Mm -hmm. So let me um, show the video now mm -hmm. uh, to give people some insight into the clip that we put together, okay. and then uh, we'll be right back to talk about it. Okay. Green lung is a term uh, derived from the coal miners that had the black lung. 
Uh, basically, the green lung is something that is a is a is nothing that they can say 100% of definitive as of yet because we haven't had the proper testing for it. But basically, it is when you breathe in keef or powdery mildew consistently, the mildew is growing spores inside your lung. And they call that the green lung, or they also call it the mushroom lung as well. Uh, and basically over time, you will, it will kill you over time if you're consistently breathing in this mold and this mildew on a consistent basis. Uh, even breathing in the Keith crystals, because those crystals, it's almost like you're breathing in like a fiberglass. You know, you're possibly cutting in and causing problems inside the lungs. Uh, the symptoms of that would be coughing up blood, uh, finding it very difficult to breathe all the time, always constantly having to uh, stand in front of a fan uh, to breathe, to get airflow going through. Uh, these are definitely strong signs that you've got some serious problems. An ordinary day of like beginning day of trimming would consist of you know, you would you'd show up to your job, they would have X amount of plants, they would need to be trimmed that day, and then they would assign you know, X amount of plants. They typically require you to, to trim, trim about a pound a day is in the market right now in the industry. Uh, very few places will pay uh, by the plant nowadays, usually it's by the hour. Uh, so your typically work day will be, say, from 7.30 to 4.30. Uh, with your regular breaks and lunches and things like that. The job itself, as far as like trimming the, the actual process where you're trimming the weed, the job itself is, the physical part of it is not necessarily hard. The hard part of it is where you have to be on your feet constantly. You're constantly, you know, holding this plant in your hand. You're constantly moving your scissors with the other hand nonstop. So, the problem that you come into is when you're in contact with the keef all day long, which is the crystals that grow in the plant, because eventually what happens is you'll get a rash that'll break out. Um, some people have allergic reactions to these type of uh, issues. And then you have the issues with the powdery mildew as well. So the last time that I trimmed uh, cannabis uh, was for one of the larger companies I won't name. And uh, basically, they would assign us to a workstation. As you're standing your station, somebody will bring up, uh, usually it comes on a bamboo rack, and you'll have four plants to five plants hanging on a rack. Uh, these plants are around, you know, two to four feet in size. And then you typically will start off into the, uh, you know, from the bottom of the plant, and then trimming my way back down. Basically what I would do is take off all the sugar leaf, which is the little small leaves, the big leaves, and then, you know, once we take the bud and we trim it, what they call debudding, which is basically when you're cutting off the buds off the stem, then you kind of just trim it up to make it look presentable for the customers when they come into the dispensaries. That's the primary object of trimming to begin with. I learned how to trim uh, basically from on the job. Uh, it's basically repetition, so it's just like anything else, you're doing the same thing every day. So speed comes in time. Uh, when I started out in this industry, I was trimming around the average 56 grams per hour, which is around a pound a day. Uh, towards the end, I was averaging around 300 plants per day. Uh, to put that into perspective, the average worker does around 40 a day. So you know, speed comes with time. Uh, you know, speed is good, uh, quality is good too. Uh, so I focus more on the quality of it, more than so the speed. The skills that I have to make me a good trimmer is making sure that the buds, when you look at it, number one, it's gonna be tight. It's gonna be dense. It's not gonna have little stems sticking out the side, no crow's feet on the bottom. Uh, if it's Something that has, uh, if it's say, uh, say you might have a bud that may have what they call nodes, it'll have three different buds on there. Usually I'll just trim those off instead of putting the whole branch into the, into the tray uh, because that adds weight for the customer. So I try to, when I trim, to make sure that when somebody looks in my bud, they're gonna see no stems, no crow's feet, very tight and very dense. 
Um, basically, when you when I stood into the room, it was a room the size I would say about 30 feet in width by 17 feet, you know. And I stood with they had typically assigned to these where they have a bench, and you'll have four people on each side. So you'll have eight people to a bench. Usually, there's two to three benches going at a time, and each side will have a rack of four plants to each side. So typically. That's how the inside, there's no windows. Um, the ventilation that you get is only from the fans that they use for drying, and that's pretty much it. When I trim, it's, it makes it, the, the difficulties that I find for myself is you're on your, I'm on my feet all day long, and I'm constantly breathing in the THC keef, the crystals, and then I'm also breathing in any other nutrients or chemicals that may have been associated with growing the plant. Uh, by doing this constantly all day long, it does cause myself respiratory problems. I've had uh, bronchitis, uh, bronchial type infections, uh, constantly due to powdery mildew because there's nothing to prevent it from, you're just breathing it in. Uh, there's no you know, de detection to know that you're even what it is. Uh, now we do know now, I uh, have an idea now for myself, uh, basically whenever I, I sneeze or uh, I start to get the rashes, you know, you can, I know for myself that that's a good sign that you know, powdery mildew is present. I would describe powdery mildew as basically like a white powdery substance. Uh, it almost looks like keef in, in itself. Um, a lot of times the consumers will not be able to know the difference between keef and the powdery mildew. Um, you can kind of rub it with your finger and it kind of like brushes off a little bit. That's how one way to detect it. It's basically created through uh, moisture that is building up. Uh, what happens is, is whenever the drying process happens in the plant, because they don't allow the plant to dry in the two week span, typically in the cannabis industry today, there's a two day drying time. So what happens is, is all the water flushes to the top of the plant and has nowhere to go. So powdery mildew and other different moles will begin to form as a result. Once those mole spores get loose in the air, it can travel to any other plant in the grow and affect it immediately and spread very fast. Powdery mildew to me is uh, very dangerous. Uh, I believe that it uh, can cause some serious respiratory problems if uh, if it's, you know, you're in contact with this consistently on a daily basis. Um, for myself personally, I believe that, you know, if, because it's something that is not being treated uh, in the industry and nobody has, you know, distinctive knowledge about it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real danger uh, to the industry. When I work as a trimmer or working to grow, you're exposed, I'm exposed to raw product versus you know, the consumer who's smoking something that's already been dried and processed. When, I, when I'm working with the raw product, it's right there, fresh, freshly grown, freshly chopped down. So it's, you know, when you're dealing with the green raw material, it's, you know, you're dealing with a very, you know, dangerous environment uh, because the mold spores are gonna be in the air if there is uh, mold on the plant and you're just standing right there next to it breathing that in. I've worked uh, in the industry, I've worked for approximately seven different uh, dispensaries, you know, on a consultant level, on a cultivation level as well. Each of these dispensaries that I personally have worked in, they've all faced the same problem. Uh, some more than others, uh, just depending on the type of warehouse they have set up. Uh, some of these warehouses that I've personally worked in before they might have been a car garage so you have leaks in the roof and things like this uh, which you know of course they're going to cause more mold to grow so it's been my experience that all of the companies that I personally worked for all battle this problem uh, other industry workers that I personally know all battle the same issue in their jobs uh, because we're growing indoors Without naming the company, I was uh, trimming for a company one time. They were known to have 
uh, a, a powdery mildew issue. Uh, this particular plant, almost half of the cola was covered in powdery mildew. Uh, I didn't even, in my experience, it's best just to you know take those buds and throw them to green waste uh, and have them you know processed be thrown away. Uh, some companies, like that particular company, will simply just cut off, cut out the powdery mildew part and still process the bud, uh, which is what that company did. You think that's okay what they did? No, that is not okay what they did. Uh, that is most, most definitely a very serious health risk to the consumer uh, because even though they do believe that fire will kill them, the powdery mildew, it will not, and it will cause some asthmatic effects uh, in the long run to people. Uh, so even one lady uh, has gone into a coma from you know, taking something that had mildew in it. Uh, it was in an article, I believe, in the Westward, where they uh, were talking about a woman who was either doing concentrates, I believe, or edibles, and ended up having an allergic reaction to the powdery mildew and ended up in a coma from it. So even though that might be an extreme case, in most cases it just causes respiratory problems, uh, there is serious risk to being exposed to this constantly all the time and smoking, for that matter. Uh, very dangerous. Most instances that I've worked in, in cultivation, whenever you see something like powdery mildew, um, if there's any kind of insects in the plant or something like that, you would notify, notify your trim manager, let them know this is you know, what you have. It's their responsibility to discard that product or to determine if they feel that it's safe enough to you know, process through. Um, I've only walked off uh, one job that was the people that had the mildew that was covering you know, most of their plant and still wanted to, to process the plant. Uh, so in those instances, yes, I, would, I walked off, absolutely. I would love to be hopeful. I think it's gonna take it to be, just has to get a DC uh, and get before the real lawmakers to you know, put some federal regulations on the industry. Uh, not enough regulating the industry, but in these instances, I think that's what's needed. I think we need to, you know, do some studies. We need to have like a pulmonologist to get involved and start testing some of the people that have been working in the industry consecutively for years and see the condition of their lungs. And then we can get some proof that's definitive and then that shuts them up. You know, there's nothing else that proves right there. So I think that's the, uh, the next step to be honest, is to have, you know, get a pulmonologist involved, find people that have been in the industry for three or four years consecutively and have been steady in it and not quit and see the condition of their lungs and see how it's really affected them or not. And then that's the true test. Okay, that was Green Lung with Scott Burtis uh, as part of a research project uh, that I conducted um, and am currently writing up um, through the University of Colorado Denver looking at occupational health and safety issues. So I'm with Scott Burtis today at Denver Open Media and we're talking about uh, respiratory health, we're talking about cannabis, and we're talking about some of his work in the cannabis industry. So Scott, let me ask you about mm -hmm. that clip which highlighted sure. this idea of green lung. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unpack it a bit more. You know, what does green lung mean to you? And you've heard, I've, I've heard you use this term mushroom lung. Yes. So for people, like if you had to explain it to your grandmother, uh, go through the steps of how do you contract it, what is it, and how do you um, uh, remedy it? Okay. Uh, green lung is a term uh, derived from the coal miners days when they had the black lung. Uh, because they had no type of protection, they were constantly breathing in all the harmful stuff from, from mining. So same thing uh, in today's day and age in the cannabis industry, because the workers, especially ones that work in the grow, uh, that are directly, not so much the trimmers, but people that work directly in the grow, you're more affected by it than anybody because you're steady breathing this in 8, 10, 12 hours a day, uh, constantly every day for five, six days a week. And with all the chemicals, and then you got the, p the powdery mildew plus the keef, what eventually happens is your lungs become what it looks like, they call it the mushroom lung because that's, it looks like a, your lung becomes, it looks like a mushroom after a certain amount of time. Uh, and also known as the green lung because of cannabis because it's an, it's an overall effect of cannabis. And what happens over time, uh, your breathing will begin to be affected. You'll start to notice uh, a lot more congestion. You'll start to notice, you know, you'll start to see that you're not, you're not functioning the same anymore. 
uh, and it happens. It happens to people uh, quite a bit because THC hooks into your capillaries and your lungs, and if you're constantly filling your lungs in with powder all day long, it's like if you took a room full of flour and just threw it all around, I mean, you're going to suffocate. And you're eventually, that's essentially what you're doing over a slow period of time. Uh, and that mildew can grow inside you and cause you to have a serious problem. So you mentioned earlier that you want to um, start, or you are starting a farm. Mm -hmm. So what would be a couple of the steps that you're taking to ensure you're reducing a uh, worker's exposure to powdery mildew? Um, creating the proper ventilation inside the grows. Uh, if we are the example to that, you know, if we can build a grow that is truly, you know, effective where there's, you know, we're limiting the powdery mildew to such low percentages. I mean, I can't say that it'd be 100% you know, free, but I can tell you that the percentages will be very, very low, lower than the 10% range for sure. So, you know, it's a proper ventilation, proper airflow, proper curing of the weed, uh, cannabis, and making sure that, like for one thing, I believe that cannabis should be cured in, a, in like a wooden barrel, uh, say like an old um, alcohol barrel, like a Jack Daniels barrel for 30 days before it should ever be on the street you know, properly cured that way so that you know that it's effective and then even testing it at that 30 day point before it even hits the street to make sure that, you know, it's, you know, mildew free. There's nothing that's, no carcinogens that would harm anyone. Uh, that would be the way that I would prevent it from happening. So Scott, I want you to talk with me, talk to the camera, mm -hmm. as if I'm a new trimigrant. I arrived to Colorado, mm -hmm. 22 years old. I'm really, really excited to work in the cannabis sector. What would you say to me to ensure I reduce my exposure, or at least so I'm armed with the right information in the workplace to properly inform the employer, or just to make sure I'm, I'm healthy and don't go home in a bad condition because of this problem? What I would tell someone is if they're looking to come into the industry, getting their badge and paying the 150 or whatever it is, um, I would tell them that, you know, first, you know, if, if they're already exposed to asthmatic effects, then they might want to consult with their doctor, get some type of, uh, you know, definitely wear your dust mask at least. Uh, it's not going to hurt you to put that on. Make sure you got sleeves to cover up, uh, you know, wear your gloves. If you have a hole in your gloves, change them uh, constantly. And then, you know, if you're knowing that you're, if you start to feel like your breathing is getting affected, then I would suggest going to a pulmonologist, you know, and at least getting checked out. Uh, but people are coming into the industry, it's just, you know, taking it day by day. Uh, this industry is tough as it is already. So if you have health problems coming into it, uh, I'd be careful. Uh, I've seen some people that have health issues quit because they can't deal with the breathing part of it. So if you're already asthmatic, then I would definitely be cautious. Uh, if you're a smoker, then I would definitely get checked out, uh, you know, before you come. And that way, you know, you get an idea, a sense of, you know, where you are before you even start. Because uh, you are probably, you are symptomatic to, you know, some definitely asthmatic bronchial type effects. For sure. You know, back to this idea of having a union as a mechanism to allow workers to um, have collective bargaining rights, right. um, to have a contract that clearly lays out, you know, workplace protections. Um, you know, Colorado, we have a little work to do to try to get a union off the ground. Um, but I know from my preliminary work that workers, they do have an interest in a mechanism like that. Yes. The problem um, we know, and it's not just here in Colorado, but elsewhere, you have employers who are actively trying to obstruct a worker's right to organize. Yes. And so I think one problem, you know, in California, they have a labor peace agreement mm -hmm. where people who have a license have to sign something that says they will not obstruct a worker's right to organize. Right. And so we need something like that here. Are you hopeful that something, we might see something like that in Colorado? I've worked with a couple of people uh, that try to get the unions up and running. Um, it's difficult. Uh, you do have some companies that, will, that were even open to letting a union come in there and even talk to the workers. Uh, of course, uh, some are not, and you know, but it's, it was getting the workers to get organized was seemingly the hardest problem. Uh, I'm hopeful, yeah, I would love to see, you know, the state, you know, implement some type of, you know, some type of union structure where the workers at least have some type of leg to stand on, you know, for sure. For you, when you were trimming and working in a cultivation facility, what was the rationale 
or what was the what was behind your decision making of supporting any kind of unionization effort? My support of the union was based on the low wages, um, and it's not a fair balance between what the workers are getting and what the owners are getting. Uh, as the workers, you're getting you know twelve to fifteen an hour, depending on you know if you're making tips or whatever, while the owner is making you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in a week. So the, while the owner might bear the cost of you know the overall grow and paying all the expenses, the profit margin is definitely way off. I mean, there's there could be you know there, to me a trimmer should be getting paid minimum fifteen an hour. Somebody in a grow should be getting paid twenty an hour. It's hard to support your family if the cost of living is way high, but they're paying you on a very low scale. There needs to be some type of balance. And you know, it's not that we're trying to. I wasn't trying to seek, you know, unfair wages for their workers and punish their owners. Like you know, car industry, it was not like that. We we're just looking for something that was you know fair and and and, and balanced. You know, uh, no pun to Fox News, but you know, it's just you know something that would be fair to me, the worker, and you, the owner. Not so much where. We're trying to take it, you know, we want three hour lunches and four weeks vacation. It's more or less just, hey guy, you know, pay me so I can support myself and feed myself to where I don't have to have, you know, struggle, you know, every month because the cannabis industry only wants to work me three days a week or, you know, something like that. It just needs to have a, there needs to be more balance into it, more structure into it. Yeah, I think bringing parity in terms of the power relationship. Um, and these comments from you are really important because in Colorado, you know, you hear all this money being generated through the sale of, of cannabis. Right. I also hear employers say, well, you know, we hear all this stuff about all the money being made, but we're really not, you know, we're struggling and we're suffering because of compliance issues and uh, high turnover with workers. Right. Um, so I think there needs to be kind of, I wouldn't say the olive branch, but um, coming to the table, the different um, representatives of the cannabis, uh, like employers group, mm -hmm. uh, worker representatives coming to the table and talking about what can we do to ensure workers are fairly paid. $15 an hour is great. I think that's called a living wage. Right. But in the Denver metro area, even that, I mean, 20 is hours, would, $20 an, an hour, hour would, would be would, barely, barely yeah. making it. Yeah, that would be something I, I think is reasonable considering the revenues that's being generated. So about these issues, are you hopeful and what gives you hope? I think there's, there is hope. I mean, if we can actually get a, a dialogue started with the owners, I think we could explain to them, you know, work out these balances. Like for an example, if they say that, you know, they have a high turnover rate. Well, I mean, we could, we could make it to where trimmers have to be certified you know, through the state, same thing with growers, you know, go through a certification process. That guarantees them, you know, put a little bit more guarantee on the table for them that they're getting quality people for the money that they're paying for so that they know ahead of time what they're getting. So, you know, there is ways to, you know, ensure on their behalf that they're not just gonna spend, because it does cost money from the time they hire an employee, you know, to the time they go through the training process, they may spend $1,800, $2,000, and if they have a high turnover rate, they're gonna take that cost out on the rest of the employees that are faithful, and that's the part that's not fair. You know, you're punishing the rest of us because of the ones that quit and went home early, and that's not, you know, so I do understand the cost, the cost pers perspective from the owners, you know, because the owners have to pay all the taxes to the state, then they have to pay all the fees for their buildings and the lights and the materials and all that. So while they are absorbing, you know, 70% of that cost, we're asking them to split to 30, you know. So we understand that, you know, they are absorbing the cost, so they do deserve a higher percentage than us, the employee, but pay us fair. You know, let us at least make a living to where we can pay our bills on time. We're not struggling every month. You know, if you know what rent is in Denver, you know that's- dollars reasonable. Then. Right, 12 bucks is not gonna, I mean, I was making, before I got to the cannabis industry, I was making around 60000 a year. And I could barely survive by myself on that. So to try to say you're gonna survive on 12 is impossible. Yeah. And that's what's happening. Uh, the other thing, the reason for the turnover is you're getting a lot of people going back home when states become legal. So when these states become, on the, they become legal again, they're just going back to their home state. 
Well, one of the things I enjoyed about what you just said about certification or training, mm -hmm. I know the UFCW in California has a training program through uh, San Francisco Community College. Right. So I think in Colorado, having some kind of training or certification uh, with UFCW could be really good to provide not just the solidarity among workers and yes. potentially getting a living wage, but workers will be properly trained, they can get the certificate, they can be certified, and they'll be committed employees. They'll yes. stick around, employers won't have to have um, you know, revolving door with trimmers and other cultivation workers. Correct. So maybe some closing words from you, Scott, what is your like prediction if you look in the crystal ball and uh, look into May 2018? Mm -hmm. Is there one or two changes you may s think we might see in Colorado? What would one or two of those changes be? The things that I'd like to see for sure would be, you know, definitely a better employee to employer relationship. Uh, there needs to be, uh, they have a lot of the corporate structure in place, but there's not a much relationship between. That's why the, you know, the union would be a very effective. I'd love to see that in place, uh, or something like it, something where they can have a, you know, a leg to stand on. Uh, love to see better pay for the workers, and then you know, the, the safety issues, you know, they have, they have to be some type of warning uh, for the workers when they come in, something that they can you know, at least know ahead of time, this is what I'm going into you know, maybe a safety video they watch or you know, something that puts the knowledge in front of them that, hey, this is what you're, this is what you're breathing in. And, you know, while cannabis is exciting to work with, it's a job. And, you know, we need to be able to make a living and support ourselves. So I hope to be able to see next year, hopefully the legislation, the Senate will be able to put some laws into place that will, you know, pr protect the workers and not just the owners. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm looking for there. So one more time, if people want to get a hold of you, can you share your email address or um, your website, whatever you're comfortable with? I am on Facebook as Nola Dabs, N-O-L-A Dabs, D-A-B-S. Same thing for YouTube, it's uh, N-O-L-A Dabs. And then uh, you know, feel free to subscribe or not. Uh, like I said, I don't, I don't do that YouTube thing to try to get uh, rich or anything like that. It's more just to get the information out. Uh, so if you could just share that information with people, that would be great. Thanks again, Scott. You've been watching Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Mario Tanyas. Um, I'm the host and producer. You can find us at www.fsngreen.org. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. The industry definitely needs to be focusing more on the safety instead of the, the, the monetary gain. Uh, and that seems to be the primary focus is the monetary gain versus you know, the actual safety of the, not just the employee, but also to the consumer as well, because it goes down the line. And I think that they, if they focus more on, let's see what cannabis can really do medically, let's eliminate these type of issues are very easily fixed uh, with simple, you know, ultraviolet technology and just, you know, having the proper, you know, equipment in place, this could be eliminated.